Good evening, Promise of Victory family. I just want to thank you for joining in tonight. Um, I'll go ahead and get every, everyone a few minutes to get on. I know it takes takes a little while before the, the numbers start building up a little bit. Um, but I am excited. I'm excited about what I'm going to be sharing tonight, um, especially after hearing Pastor's message on Sunday about that church. And I believe that where we're heading in Revelations this week is also an introduction to uh, that church and with a, how a church is supposed to operate in, uh, in the dark world that we live in. So I'm excited to, to get into this and for Jesus to learn through Jesus's word and what he teaches us about the church and how to operate as a church and how me and you are supposed to be um, in this world uh, to represent his kingdom and his church and, and just be a light unto the world that we're supposed to be. So I'm excited about that. And I know that I wanted to jump into Revelations chapter two and three this week, um, but I'm not. I, I said that last time that the next time I, we was going to jump into it, but I'm not because I came across another scripture and there was just um, at reading the end of chapter one, there was just something else that hit me and touched me and, and just made me uh, stop and, and need to, to study for myself first and then feel the need to explain to the church also uh, what that meant for us. So I'm going to be, we're going to continue our reading in Revelations chapter one. This will be our last time in Revelations chapter one. After this, we will be moving on to chapters two and three. Um, and I don't know how fast or how short that'll go. Uh, we, I'm just going to go with the flow of the spirit and what I feel like and what we have enough time, you know, to do uh, just on these Wednesday night uh, Bible studies. So let's get into Revelations chapter one. I'm going to start at verse 12 and I'm going to read a lot of this, but I'm really only going to uh, start the teaching on at the end, basically on uh, verse 20. But I want to go ahead and read through it because uh, verse 20 explains what he's talking about in verse 12. So it's like you, you you know, to get the whole understanding of what John is seeing here, we need to go through it um, through to from starting from verse 12 all the way through. He says, starting in verse 12, I'm reading from the uh, New Living Translation. He said, when I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands and standing in the middle of the lampstands were someone like the son of man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were flames of fire. His feet were like polished brass refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like many ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was like the sun in all of his brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead, but he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. Write down what you have seen, both the things which are now happening and the things that will happen. This is the meaning of the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven gold lampstands. This is why I wanted to read all the way from verse 12, because it's verse 12 that tells us that John tells us that he saw the seven golden lampstands and one standing in the middle of them, like unto the son of man. And he says, this is, so Jesus is now speaking. The spirit is speaking to John and telling them, uh, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Um, now what you need to understand, what we need to understand from that is the angels is not actually speaking of an angel. Um, although I, I, you know, I do believe that God sends angels for our protections and that we can call upon him to send angels to minister to us. We know that when Jesus was tempted, uh, in the wilderness, 40 days, 
uh, and 40 nights that after the enemy, after Satan had left him, the Bible says that the angels came and ministered unto him. So I do believe that that angels are appointed to us at times. We know that there's multiple cases in the Bible where God sent Gabriel with a message to somebody and uh, an angel and sent Michael to help Gabriel as the, you know, the prince of the power of, of Persia was trying to stop him from getting that message to Daniel. And there's all of those things. And I believe that. But when you look into the, the deep root of this word angel, what it it, it also is translated into messenger. So I believe, and most scholars believe, that when the Bible is speaking of, when Jesus says, I hold uh, that, the, that the stars in my hand are the angels, what he's speaking of is the messengers of the church, which would also then be translated into either the pastors or leaders or the leader of the church. You know, most likely the pastor of the church is who Jesus is bringing this letter to. So first and foremost, you know, it starts at the head. It starts with Jesus and then it runs down. Then then the pastor is going to be uh, the senior pastor, which in this church is Pastor Albert Mitchum uh, and, 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 and uh, Pastor Amanda Mitchum. Those two are, are that it's going to come down from Jesus to them first and then to the church. So even the things that Jesus is speaking to the church, if the church is out of line in some things, the, the, the first people that Jesus is going to hold accountable is those senior pastors, the, the ones that are pastoring and looking over the church. This is who the letter is going to first. And then, as as Jesus said, as the Spirit continues, it tells us at the end of every message, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. So so it not it doesn't stop there. It it starts there and then it flows down and it also the message is for every single individual uh, that is a part of the church. Uh, which is the body of Christ. So he says the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, the thing that I wanted to explain as we go into uh, chapters two and three is that of the golden lampstands, because in, in my mind, I question, well, why is the golden lampstand is what Jesus is using as a symbol for the church? And as I did this, I began to to study the golden lampstand and look at why it was constructed and the purposes of it to see what is the relation of it to the church. So when we think about the golden lampstand, the lampstand um, that is used as a representation of the church uh, was an article of the Mosaic Tabernacle, right? In Exodus 25, uh, God is given instructions on how the furniture in the tabernacle um is, is to be constructed, and one of the pieces that he gives the instructions for is in Jewish called the menorah, but is, which is what we are referring to as the golden lampstand. So let's go to Exodus chapter 25, and I believe it starts at verse 31, and we'll read what God said, how God instructed uh, Moses to construct the lampstand. He said, make a lampstand of pure hammered gold. Make the entire lampstand and its decorations of one piece, the base, the center stem, uh, lamp cups, bulbs, and petals. Make it with six uh, branches going out from the center stem, three from each side, right? Six branches going out from the center stem, three from each side. Um each of the six branches will have three lamp cups shaped like almond blossoms, complete with buds and petals. Craft the center stem of the lampstand with four lamp cups shaped like almond blossoms, complete with buds and petals. Uh, there will be an almond bud beneath each pair of branches with the six branches extended from the center stem. The almond buds and branches must be of one piece with the center stem. They must be. They must be hammered from pure gold. Then make the seven, the seven lamps of the lampstand and set them so they reflect their light forward. All right? The light uh, snuffers and trays must also be made of pure gold. You will need 75 pounds of pure gold for the lampstand and its accessories. Be sure that you make everything according to the pattern that I have shown you. Here on this mountain. So God told Moses, I want you to make a lampstand. 
uh, and put it in where we're talking about is furniture that is being constructed for the inside for the holy place in the tabernacle. So you had the holy place and then you had the holy of holies. So in the holy place, he's saying, I want you to make a lampstand. Now, we understand. Let's go to Leviticus first, uh, chapter 24, 1 through 4, because God gives instructions for the operation of the lampstand. So Leviticus 24, 1 through 4. This is what God says. The Lord says to Moses, command the people of Israel to bring us pure evil of pressed olives for the light to keep the lamps burning continually. This lampstand that stands in the tabernacle in front of the inner curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant. Aaron must keep the lamps burning in the Lord's presence all night. Uh, this is a permanent law for you, and it must be observed from generation to generation. Aaron and the priest must tend to the lamps of the pure gold lampstand uh, continually in the Lord's presence. <coughs> so what the lampstand was to do uh, was, was to give light inside in what would be an otherwise dark place. So if the lamp, if there was never, if there wasn't a lampstand or something to give light inside the tabernacle, which was where the priests did their priestly duties and the Levites did their priestly duties every day, if it wasn't for something in there to give light, then they wouldn't be able to see. It would be an, it would be a total dark place. It would be in total darkness. So so God instructed the lampstand in order to shed light and it would be a dark place. So this is the first and, and most easiest uh, similarity to understand between the purpose of the lampstand and the purpose of the church. Now, I do understand that there's there's a there's a lot of other things uh, with this the construction of this lampstand that we could also compare to the construction of the church. Like, for example. The Bible that, for example, God says that it wants it to have a base. So there's a base in the middle. There's a stem. There's a base. And then and then from that base, there's a stem that goes up in the middle of the lampstand. And then out of that are six branches that come out of the side. Well, automatically, that makes me think of John chapter five, where Jesus said, I am the vine in the middle and you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him will bring forth much fruit. And it says, for without me, you can do nothing. Instantly, that's the scripture that comes in my mind when I think about the uh, the the vine, the, the middle, the middle stem and the branches that come out of it. Another thing that comes in my mind when I think about it instantly is the fact that it was hammered out of pure gold, out of one piece of pure gold. And to me, that speaks to the unity that God expects the church to operate in, that we ought to be in one mind and one accord. When we read the, uh, you know, the book of, of Acts, when it talks about the first church and, and the church coming in, uh, the church that was coming in a, uh, to existence through the apostles, it, it, it oftentimes it speaks to them being in one mind and one accord and how they gave everything for each other and they communed with each other and they taught each other uh, in each other's houses and they were all in one mind and one accord. They were all in the same place. And, and, and I believe that God puts a great emphasis on unity that I don't know that we as a church often honor. But we should and we need to because that's what the church is supposed to be, a unified church. Uh, we in Christ, as we are in Christ, God says that uh, Jesus, when he was praying in John chapter 17, says that uh, as he prayed for for us, he prayed that as he and the Father was one, that we would all be one together and that we will be one in him and that also that as we are one in him we will be one with him and the father as well so that's the unity that's the picture of unity that jesus provides as as we know the bible says that there are two ways and, and pastor spoke on it this sunday when he said uh there the greatest two commandments was to love god with all your heart all your mind and all your soul and then also to love your neighbor as yourself said that this one that the second one is just like as the first one. I like that the Bible points that out. The second one is just as like the first one, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So we're supposed to be a church that 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 is unified with God and also unified with each other. And God puts a big emphasis on unification. And I believe that this, it, he puts so much of an instant uh, of, of, of emphasis on unification that it's still hard for some of us to understand how God could be one God and three persons. That's the greatness of unity. 
that, that God speaks about when it comes to, to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And we ought to be unified as a church as well. Um, so I believe that that, that the lampstand being hammered in the, out of one piece of pure gold. This wasn't you made a branch here, you made a branch here, and then somehow you like soldered them to the stem. This was you had one square block of gold and chiseled out every detail of this gold to where this gold was never separated. It was all just one solid piece. And that's what we need to focus on as being a church. And I believe that that's what we are focus on it being a church here. That's why we're having the block party and that's why we're trying to have the collective and that's why we're trying to do other things to, to become a family. And we're always promoting around here that, that we are a family. And, and you know, one, uh, if you come once or come a thousand times, we are, you are family. And that's why we try to promote that around here. Cause we believe that the church is supposed to be a church unified, uh, together. Um, how great is it? Uh, for brothers that dwell in unity, the books of Psalms says, I think in, in Psalms 133 or 134, or maybe 33 or 34, something like that. Um, but so anyway, there's that too. But the only thing that I really want to speak about, which I believe is the main emphasis for the construction of the lampstand and the menorah and why it is, um, why, uh, why it is compared to the church is because it, it is a an object that gives light in a dark place, right? So in this way, we can understand that uh, the church is also supposed to be a source of light, and what would be and what would otherwise be dark places. And then it goes even deeper than that because Jesus. Jesus continually tells us, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So we, we, we're talking about the church that is compared to the lampstand, that is a source of light and will be dark places. But Jesus goes deeper than that. And at every church that he addresses, he says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. So in other words, every principle that is spoken over the church as a whole is also applicable to every individual believer. So that as the lampstand is a source of light, so also the church is a source of light. So also every and every individual believer is also supposed to be a source of light and what otherwise would be dark places. So this, I believe that this is the reason for the construction of the menorah. Now I continue to to explain to you in uh, that in the book of of Revelations, there's a lot of symbols uh, that are spoken in here, and I and and there were seven physical churches that that these letters were sent to, but but I, I believe that Jesus was even using that as seven being the symbolic for completion and wholeness because there were more than seven churches at this time. Just when we read in, in, in you know, in the epistles of our Bible, we can see that there was the, there was a church of Colossae, which was a church of the Philippians. There was a lot of churches that didn't get addressed. There was the Galatians. There was, there was, uh, there was a lot of other churches, the, the, the Thessalonians. There's a lot of other churches that didn't get addressed in these seven churches. But every every problem and and every every uh, commendation uh, and and every reprimand that Jesus made to these seven churches is all that needs to be made for the church as a whole, because seven is a number for completion and wholeness. Um, so. Uh, so just as uh, the lampstand is a source of light, so also the church is a source of light. So also every individual of every individual of the church is supposed to be a source of light and what otherwise would be dark places. Now, to understand this in a spiritual sense, uh, we, we, we understand that a lot of times when the Bible speaks of darkness, it speaks of evil. All right. And 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 opposite a lot of times when it. When the Bible speaks of light, light is a representation of Christ, but not always. So sometimes even light can can appear as evil, right? Because if you think about it, even in like in the natural world, 
when we would watch, I think it was cartoons or old shows or whatever, when someone would have a thought, what would happen? Over top of their head, a light would appear. And that light would that light would shine. And then this meant that they had that, you know, that they had a good thought or an idea. And so sometimes light is just a, it's a, light could be a representation of knowledge. But as the church and as Christians, we're not to just shine knowledge, but we're to shine the knowledge of God. You know, as as um, our weapons, our weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, casting, uh, pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations and anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, against what we know about God. So having so so shining light is not anything that is produced within ourselves. This this is why I'm getting at this to say that, you know, the Bible lets us know that even Satan sometimes appears as an angel of light. And and it also tells us in Matthew chapter six, Jesus told us, I hope I'm not confusing anyone. I feel like I'm jumping all over the place. In Matthew chapter six, let me slow down. Jesus told us that the light of the body is the eye. And if thy eye be single, then thy whole body is full of light. But if thy eye be evil, then thy whole body is full of darkness. Well, if the light that is in thee be darkness, then how great is the darkness, is what Jesus told us. So in understanding that, I I understand that the light that I am supposed to shine is not a light that is produced out of myself, but it is the light of Christ. 1 Peter 2 and, 2 and 9 tells us that we should show forth praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. light that light uh, being Christ. John chapter 1 tells us when speaking of Christ from his divine nature that in him was life and that life was the light of men. The light shined in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. Um, what that means is that it could not overcome it. Darkness, listen to me, darkness cannot overcome a life that has been filled with the light of Christ. So the light that the menorah, that the lampstand, that the church is to, is, is to shine is not a light that is produced within ourselves, but it is the light that comes from living the life of Christ, all right, from accepting the life that Christ offers to us. Uh, remember, he said that, that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. This is why John reminds us later in, in 1 John chapter 4, when he says, little children, you are from God, uh, he who had, uh, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Again, when we go back to John chapter 1, the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. This is why you have overcome them, because he who was in you is greater than he who is in the world. The darkness cannot overcome a life that has been filled with the light of Christ. That ought to give somebody, make somebody do a victory dance in their living room right now. When you realize that Satan is under your feet, even though he doesn't always feel like he's under your feet, sometimes you think he has the upper hand, but a life that has been filled with the light of Christ cannot be overcome by darkness. And that's what you it did. It doesn't matter what is going on all around you. It doesn't matter how much is coming down upon you. There's things that you've been praying for that they haven't happened yet. It seems like things are getting worse before they're getting better. But we still need to understand, believe and have faith that a life that has been uh, a life that has been that has the light of Christ shining in it cannot be overtaken. By darkness. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5 that we are the light of the world. 
A city that is set up on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do you light a candle and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, giving light unto all that are in the house. And then he goes on to say, let your light shine so shine through that men may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. So how do we let our light shine before men that they may glorify our father, which is in heaven once we see our good works? Once they see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. How do we do that? How do we as a church shine the light of Christ in this dark world, right? We are the, we are the lampstand. We're compared to the lampstand, which a lampstand was an was a article in the Mosaic Tabernacle that gave light in a dark place. And we too, who have been called out of darkness and into his marvelous light, are people that are supposed to reflect the light of Christ in otherwise dark places. But how do we do that? I think one of the most challenging verses or scriptures for all believers that Jesus had ever given us was when he said, if any man uh, will come after me, let him first deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me daily. All, all of those are hard. The first, the denying ourselves. I mean, we, we are uh, creatures of self-preservation. Uh, we really are. So it, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot in order for us to deny ourselves. And it, and it actually takes a, a strength and a power that we don't even have within ourselves, that it has to be the Holy Spirit within us that does it, that does it in us, that helps us deny ourselves. And then taping up our cross is taking, is, is being able to suffer, is long suffering and being able to suffer the same way that Christ did and still walk uh, as children of God and still still uh, keep the faith and finish uh, uh, and finish our course as the Apostle Paul says and finish our race to be able to still do that and then we, and he says it's not enough to do it once you, every day you have to have this mindset every day we have to deny ourselves pick up our cross and follow him so following him means to be as I am, walk as I walk, be my disciples, adhere to my teachings, adhere to my teachings, follow me, could also mean imitate me. So in other words, in order to shine the light of Christ, we have to imitate the life of Christ. This is the life that the church is called to. In order to shine the light of Christ, we have to imitate the life of Christ. This is what Jesus is going to explain to us in the next couple chapters, is how the church can shine the light of Christ by imitating the life of Christ, by being his disciples and imitating him and and not only hearing the word, not only being a hearer of the word, but also being a doer of the word and, and making it applicable to our lives. This is how we reflect the light of Christ um, in a lost and, and, and dying world, in the darkness, in the dark recesses of this world. This is how we reflect the light of Christ, by living out the life of Christ. So Jesus explains this to us in great detail in chapters two and three. And look, I'm almost done already. I, I, I didn't intend to keep you long and, and, I, and I haven't. You know, I'm sticking to that. Uh, but, but I do want to give you two practices that you can follow until the next time that we meet again. And we begin to go through Revelations two and three and we listen to the 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 way that Jesus reprimanded the church, we'll learn from the from the from how Jesus commended the church for the things that they did that were worthy of praise and how he reprimanded the church for the things that they did and told them to repent, which was to turn away from those things uh, and begin to walk in, in the life that he has ordained for us to walk in, basically. Um, so we're going to learn a lot that actually everything that the church needs to know in order to operate 
as the church, which is the body of Christ, which is the light that, that has been set in the world that cannot be hid, that men may see our good, our, our good works and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Every detail that we need to know, I believe, about the, about the church, Jesus put in these two chapters uh, for the seven churches of how we need to operate as a church. Uh, and how we need to function, I guess is a better word, how we need to function as a church in this dark world in order to shed the light of Christ upon those that need it, right? So, but I just want to give you two practices until we actually go through those things in detail in chapters two and three. The first one is to share the light of the gospel, right? So sharing the light of the gospel uh, is the first practice that we can do as being the light of the world, as shedding and reflecting the light of Christ in this dark world. And I'm going to go to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's go there, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to start at verse 1, reading through to verse 7. It says, therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this new way, we never give up. We reflect all shameful deeds and, under, and, under, and underhanded methods. We don't try to trick anyone or distort the word of God. We tell the truth before God and all who are honest know this. So this is a word for the church today, for today, for this day and this age right now in this nation and in this country that we we need to be a church that is able to stand on the word of God no matter what everyone else thinks about it and this is something that pastor was just preaching this Sunday but I promise you I already had this put together before I heard that sermon so the Holy Spirit is just working this in the church this is something that we need to be able to as he said uh, we tell the truth before God that we we don't try to trick anyone or distort the word of God in any way. The word of God is the word of God. And all we can do is tell people the word of God and they will receive it however they want to receive it. But just because it doesn't line up with the lifestyle or the way that we uh, uh, that we live doesn't mean that we can change or twist or, or distort or trick people with the word of God. Because the word is what it says it is, and the word defends itself. It doesn't really even need me or us to defend it. The word will defends itself because it's a living word, and it'll eat a person alive when this word gets a hold of them, or either, as God says, that sometimes God will give a person up to a reprobate mind. Because they refuse to hear and believe this word. As a matter of fact, when we continue to read this, we, we realize that it, is a, that, that it is Satan that has the mind of people blinded. If the good news we preach is hidden be, behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. That's a good thing for the church to grab hold of right there. We're not going preaching and promoting ourselves. This ain't about me. Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm nobody, just a servant. Your servant for Jesus' sake. The only reason why I'm telling you this information is because I love you is because first God loves you. And the Bible says that God is, is not mocked uh, concerning his promise, but is long suffering and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come unto repentance. So the whole reason that God hasn't just ended this thing is because there's more people on God's radar that he wants to come. Actually, all people God wants to come unto repentance. Uh, so there, there is there. Uh, and that's the reason why God hasn't just, Jesus hasn't stepped through uh, the cloud yet and just called us home and ended this whole thing and, and destroyed the earth and started over with the new heaven and the new earth is because he's long suffering. So, and because he loves you and I love you. And that's the reason why I'm telling you the truth. 
not because I want to shame you or disgrace you, and I'm not even condemning you because we're not, as a church, we're not here to condemn. I'm not even condemning you. God does that. I just need to re, I just need to relate this truth to you so that you know the truth and don't continue to be blinded, that your mind continues to be blinded by Satan and the, and by the enemy and the taxes that he has your mind wrapped up in. All I'm here to do is relate truth to you. I'm just a servant. I'm nobody, right? A servant for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let there be light and darkness has made this light shine in our hearts so that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clays of jar, uh, fragile clay, ah, fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves. So one of the practices that we can do as being a light that's reflecting the light of Christ as being a lampstand, the church, which is also spoken to every individual as reflecting the light of Christ, is to share the, the light of the gospel or the word of light. Um, the second practice that we can do is live as people of light. So not only share the so not only preach the light, but also practice what we preach. All right, live as people of light. Uh, Ephesians 5 and 8 says, For once you were full of darkness, but now you have the light from the Lord, so live as people of light. Romans uh, chapter 13, 12 through 14, and I'm going to read this from the NAS, uh, from the uh, New American Standard Bible, NASB, says, The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us rid ourselves of the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day. Not, now listen to these things. Hold on, I'm going I'm to I'm back up a little bit. Let us therefore rid ourselves of the deeds of darkness. We have been called out of darkness and into his marvelous light is what First uh, Peter tells us, that we should show forth praises Unto him that has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So, it, there, so it's understandable that because we have been called out of darkness, there's still some of that darkness that wants to rise up in us. But in Romans, Paul tells us, let us rid ourselves of the deeds of darkness. All right. This is this could also be seen as as Paul said in, in Romans chapter 12. And 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 uh, being not conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our minds. That means that all of the things that I have learned before Christ that were not of Christ needs to be conformed, needs to be transformed in the way of thinking like Christ and putting on the mind of Christ. All right? We need to put on the mind of of Christ. So putting on the mind of Christ helps me understand that I have the victory. Helps me understand. One of the things that I that that was that was so unique about Jesus was how everyone that spoke about him spoke of the authority that he, even though they didn't quite understand, he's just somebody from from God. Does any good thing come out of Nazareth? And yet they said, but man, when he speaks, he speaks with such authority as he commands the crowd as if, as if I'm someone that as if he's someone that I'm supposed to listen to. And Jesus told his disciples that I have given you this same authority. He says, I have given you the power to walk over serpents and scorpions and, and over all the power of the enemy. Well, when you break down that word or when you read it in another translation, that word power actually means authority. The same authority that Jesus has is the one that he gives us to operate in. 
we have that authority too. So in other words, when we encounter people and when we speak to people and share the light of the gospel, they should all feel some kind of weight of authority that comes from what we're, what we're saying and what we're doing and how we're living and the things that they're seeing in our lives. And, and to know that also is not just for other people, but we need to know within ourselves that we have this authority in these earthen vessels, we have this authority in us that was given us by to us by Christ that we can take authority over the enemy. Meaning that when the enemy tries it, and I understand, listen, I understand that everyone deals, everyone has a mind, and everyone's mind gets tempted. And by the enemy and the enemy is always trying to deceive our minds. And the greatest battle that we ever fight is the battle right here. It, that is right here in our own heads. That's the greatest battle that we ever fight against the enemy. And that's where the enemy tries to win the battle because they, he knows that that's his greatest chance to get us to walk away from this great blessing and promises that we have. So, but listen to me. Jesus gave us the power to take to cast down imaginations and any high thing that tries to exalt itself against what I know, or what we know about God. So when the enemy speaks these things in our minds, what we need to do is speak back to our minds, not to the enemy. We don't even need to speak to the enemy. As the Bible tells us about uh, Michael, when Michael was was uh, was was fighting over the body of Moses, that that he just that all he said was Satan, the Lord rebuked you. He didn't even spend time trying to argue with this devil over what was supposed to happen here. Just Satan, the Lord rebuke you. So we don't even need to convince the enemy that we have authority. He already knows it. And he hates to see when we learn how to, to take ownership of it and actually use it. We need to convince ourselves. The person that we need to convince that we have the authority is us. That when he begins to bring these things against our mind and try to get him to travel down in our heart and, and tries to make us become these things that he is deceiving us of, the thing that we need to remember is that we have authority over every thought and over every high thing that tries to exalt itself against what we know about God and God's word and the promises that he has given us. And we need to speak those things over ourselves and to ourselves to remind ourselves that we are the ones in control here. We are the ones that have the control over our own minds. We are the ones that have the authority over our lives. That is through Christ Jesus has the authority and he has given it to us and he is the one that is the author and the finisher of our faith. Not these images or these thoughts or these words that the enemy is trying to plant in our mind you're not the author and finisher of our faith, devil. Jesus is. So we need to understand that and that Jesus gives us the authority. So I'm going to go back over this scripture again after going through the middle of it like that. But it says, the night is almost gone and the day is new. Therefore, let us rid ourselves of the, of the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day. This is what he says. Not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and debauchery, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh in regards to its lusts. Make no provisions for the flesh in regards to its lusts. Now, I'm not saying that any of that will be easy. I'm understanding that all of those things is a fight for some of us. Some of us have, have fought them before and they're no longer a fight for us. But every, each and every one of us, make no mistake about it, is fighting something in our minds. We're fighting something in our every single saved person across the face of this planet. I don't care how good they preach. 
I don't care how many how many people that they led to the Lord or that they've laid hands on people and limbs have grown from that wasn't there before. I'm telling you, there's things that they struggle with that the enemy brings them against them, but we have to fight against them. All right, we have to not do these things. We have to take authority over our own selves. When those things present themselves in our minds, we can take authority over our minds and take authority over those things because Jesus has given us the authority and he is the one that is the author and finisher of our faith, not ourselves and surely not our enemy. All right, so uh, the next couple chapters, uh, Jesus breaks down more in detail. Those were just two things that I was giving you that we can do, you know, until we meet again, um, which is every third week of the month till we meet again. I was just giving you a couple things that we can do as the church as reflecting the light of Christ, which is sharing the light of the word, uh, the, the word of the light, the word of light, and also just living as people of light. You know, living our lives as people of light and and, and being that example, uh, you know, because, you know, one of the scriptures, of course, that Paul says that we are a pistol that are read by all men. So, you know, a lot of times people will watch what you do uh, way before they hear what you say, uh, because a lot of people believe that people are hypocrites. And unfortunately, that's a tag uh, that the church has gotten for a long time. And I'm not even saying that it's wrongfully so. Uh, we we have been hypocritical. I mean, I mean, I have most of it's because we're human, um, and people don't give us a chance to make mistakes. Uh, you know, I get it. You know, a lot of you know a lot of the hip things that they are calling hypocritical is just the fact of of us sometimes just not making the right choices in life and making the mistake and that birthing out of our humanness and and not actually tapping into our authority that Jesus has given us but kind of just going along with what our mind was telling us. And it wasn't Christ that was leading us in that direction in the first place. Um, but, and so, but, but anyway, uh, understand that, that God has mercy. His mercies are made new every morning. God has forgiven us uh, for those, for those things when we ask and when we turn away from them and, and start on a, a, a different path, walking away from those things. Uh, and we'll continue to fight. We'll continue to make mistakes. Uh, but but we need to continue to walk in Christ and live our lives as people of light um, as much as we can. So that's what the church is supposed to do. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm excited to get into uh, as Jesus breaks down, you know, the next or of course, our next one will be the church of Ephesus. I don't know if we'll go over into the church of Smyrna as well, because that's the, the second one in line. But I don't know if we'll go over to the church of Smyrna as well, or if we'll just do Ephesus and then or if we'll do one church, which will be seven times for us. If we'll do, you know, one church and go through those things. I don't know. However, however, the Holy Spirit leads us. But I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you for being a part of this. Um, I pray that you are getting something out of this teaching. I know that I've been long through chapter one and and uh, I, I hope like in earlier when I start speaking all fast, I hope that I slowed it down enough for you to understand and, and for you to gain the victory uh, and and for people to be able to see you gain the victory and that's your light being shed before men that they may glorify our father. Uh, which is in heaven. So I'm going to just say a quick prayer over us um, before we go. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray that this message touches us in such a way that we shed our light um, in this dark world that reflect the light of Christ, oh Lord, and that would cause people to want what we have, would cause people to know that they are loved, that they are even cherished, oh Lord, because you cherish us, oh God, and uh, cause people to know that they are loved, that they are cherished, that there is um, a healing, oh God, for, for uh, whatever sicknesses that they are dealing with, oh God, and that you are, Lord Jesus, the son of righteousness with healing in his wings, oh Lord, and that you can touch a life and change it and transform it and use it for your holy purpose, no matter uh, what it has been through and, and the choices that it made previously to meet in you. So I just pray that through this, we as the light of the church would help people get free uh, from the darkness of sin uh, that is surrounding them and begin to step into the light of Christ 
and uh, do the will and purpose that you have set out and set forth for them to do and be uh, their destiny that you have created them for. So Lord, we just thank you for this word and we just pray uh, that your spirit continues to be with us, lead us and guide us uh, in such a way that we reflect you everywhere that we go, uh, that people know that, that who we are because of whose we are. In your precious and holy name, I pray. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for all that you've done and continue to do in our lives. In Jesus' holy name, amen.